I have always been impressed by the amazing intellectual growth and insight of the apostles that resulted from receiving the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. You might recall how supposedly good fishermen needed instruction from Jesus about when and where to put out their nets. And now, just one week after Pentecost, they have figured out the most holy trinity. Well, it didn't happen quite that way. While we celebrate the feast of the most holy trinity one week after Pentecost, it took a few centuries for the church to work out our understanding of the trinity. And while we will soon recite our creedal faith in the triune God, the trinity, like God's very self, will always remain elusive and mysterious. Thus, homilists throughout the centuries have been warned that if they speak very long about the Trinity, they are likely to find themselves mired in a heresy of some form or the other. Aware of the theological minefields, I've always found it best to begin with something that is absolutely certain. You might think of it as my take on Descartes' famous dictum, I think, therefore, I am. If anything is obvious to me, it is that I am not God. I am not God. I am not even going to suggest that we take a vote on that. <laughs> I assure you, I am not God. In saying this, I am accepting that my origin, my existence, and my destiny belong not to me, but to God. I am not the cause of my being. And if I am to have any existence after death, it will have to be through the act of another. When left to my own devices, I find that I am unable to do the things I would wish, and I even do things I wish not to do. Although Paul, in his letter to the Romans, speaks eloquently of suffering producing endurance that in turn produces character, that in turn produces hope, I find that my life is decidedly less linear. Suffering sometimes leads to depression and pity and hopelessness. As for endurance, you won't find me signing up for a 5K race let alone a marathon, which some would interpret as a sign of a slothful and ignoble character. And I have many days when disappointing doubt seems to overwhelm non-disappointing hope. In short, I experience myself as being powerless in the face of death and much of life. Thus, I feel a need to be saved not only from the circumstances surrounding me, but sometimes from my very self as well. But who can save me? Who can set me free? Just as I cannot save myself, so too no other human being can save me. I hope you will not take offense at this. You cannot save me any more than I can save you. The only being with the power to save, we call God. And even in saying this, I recognize with everyone who has come before me that God is beyond all human language. Thus, in our first reading from Proverbs, the author describes a relationship between God and Lady Wisdom, as if God is somehow separate from wisdom, when in fact there is no wisdom without God. Moreover, it should be noted that the author clearly understands that God is beyond human gender. And if I say, like Jesus, that God is love or God is Father, I use words that really don't fit when spoken of God. For what we know is human love, which is always flawed and selfish, and human fatherhood, which never satisfies expectations. The categories we employ to think about other things cannot be used satisfactorily of God. 
God is not one being among many to whom we turn our attention. God is being itself. It is God who sustains our thoughts as we turn from one subject to another. He is present in and through them. And it is God who stirs our hearts to ponder his mystery. He has found us even as we begin to search for him. If we turn quietly to our deepest human experiences, love, suffering, beauty, we discover refractions of God's presence and hear echoes of his voice. From these glimmers and echoes, I have come to believe and hope that God desires to save me, though why God desires this often defies explanation. Along with the psalmist, I can ask of God, what is man that you should be mindful of him? Life can be challenging for those of us who recognize that we are an acquired taste. Yet my belief and hope stem from the fact that the only thing I really know of God is what God has done, is doing, and will do for me. God is utterly beyond our grasp. Yet scripture reveals him as Emmanuel, God with us. Not only does God sustain the world with the very hand that made it, but God chooses to be intimately one of us in the person of Jesus. It is out of my experience of God's saving act that I am led from doubt to belief and from self-absorption to praise for God. Such is the experience recounted in the scriptures. Our reading from the book of Proverbs records that the ever-present wisdom of God finds delight in humankind. Imagine it. God delights in you and even me. Paul records that we find peace with God even in the midst of our sufferings and that the love of God is poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus tells us that the Spirit will guide us to all truth. This truth is not an abstract intellectual concept, but is grounded in what God has done, is doing, and will do for us. As the theologian Catherine Mori Lacuna described it, God is for us. God is for us. God is on our side. For the Christian, the saving act of God reaches its culmination in Jesus Christ. But Jesus can be the means of salvation only if he is God, because only God can save. Thus, we can say that the doctrine of the Trinity is derived from our own experience of what God has done, is doing, and will do for us. This is how we experience God for us, whom we meet in Jesus by the power of the Spirit, since only God has the power to reveal God's self to us. Put another way, God for us completes us. God brings us to the fullness of being. Even on my most doubt-laden days, God is with me and for me. God is with us and for us. In fact, it is easier for God to work through my doubt than my certitude. When I think I know all the answers, God can seem strangely absent. Yet when I am willing to acknowledge my ignorance and afflictions, the love of God is poured into my heart. When I seek God out, he often seems elusive like a figure forever disappearing around the next corner. Yet when we sit down, weary of the search, we discover that we are and always have been seated at God's feet and that God is and always will be with us and for us.